Impact of Influence, The Murdoch Family Murders. This is the unfolding story of a powerful South Carolina family, the mysterious deaths they are linked to, and our quest to bring you the truth. Hello, friend. It's Matt Harris and Seton Tucker. We're always so grateful that you spend time with us. Very, very much appreciated. And if you want to reach out, MurdochPodcast.com, Murdoch Podcast on Facebook, Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. Dive right into this almost 100 page motion that was made and presented by Alec Murdoch's defense team. And there are a lot of things to hit. We're going to talk with a forensic scientist a little bit later about the real specific science that was done. But this motion is to compel the state to turn over material that would shed light on why an expert witness changed his opinion on the presence of blood from high-velocity impact spatter in a shirt worn by Murdoch the night of the killings. His name is Tom Bevel, and the defense wants all of the exchanges and communication between Bevel and the state. Seton, where do you want to start on this? There was two motions, but we'll put them all together for the sake of this podcast. So let's point to the motion and tell you why Defense is having a problem with the test. And as I mentioned, the guy changed his opinion. Well, and the defense is also claiming that evidence was destroyed. And by destroyed, they're not meaning that it was burned in the backyard or anything like that. They're saying that the test that the prosecution conducted on a shirt worn by Alec Murdoch makes it impossible for them to conduct their own testing. So they did the three tests. And then Tom Bevel is their expert they're going to use. He's in Oklahoma. Explain what happens when they originally, according to the defense, originally present the Alec Murdoch t-shirt to Bevel. Right. So his initial opinion says that the stains on the white t-shirt are consistent with transfers, which that's the bottom of the shirt, which I don't think is in contention, and not back spatter from a bullet wound. So he says that it is not consistent with back spatter. Now, Sled agents say to him, well, how about if we bring it to you and you get a better look? He says, just mail it to me. And they're like, nah, we'll fly it to Oklahoma. That's, we we want to do it that way. The chain of custody, we want to watch that. He says, chain of custody doesn't matter if you mail it and you have a, uh, the barcode on it. Like, yeah, let's do it. So then what do Harpootlian and Griffin say is the reason that the sled agents fly to Oklahoma instead of just mailing it? Because according to this motion, they're saying that the prosecution would need to show some sort of spatter on the shirt uh, to fit their narrative that it was Alec because Paul was shot in a small closet um, and it would be impossible for him to have shot Paul without getting some sort of blood on him. They say that the sled officers fly out to kind of bring the T-shirt, show some photos And it's implied that possibly persuade the expert to change his opinion. Side note, he ends up not being able to even test the shirt. He he does change his report, but he he can't test the shirt. Right. And in this new opinion, he said that there are 100 plus stains that are consistent with spatter on the front of the T-shirt. And from the motion, this quote, Sled did not like Mr. Bevel's initial report because it said the stains on Mr. Murdoch's shirt were not consistent with blood spatter. The Zoom call with him was meant to get him to change his opinion. In response, he apparently asked to examine the shirt. It is reasonable that when changing his opinions to be what the state wanted it to be, Mr. Bevel would at least want the cover of saying he reviewed additional evidence before changing his opinion. And we'll get more into that, by the way, with our expert coming up in a little bit. What do you want to hit next on this almost 100-page motion? Right. So there were a lot of exhibits attached to this motion, and there are a lot of information that we got from the exhibits. First, I kind of want to just go with the synopsis, which was given in one of the uh, exhibits. It said, Alec Murdoch stated he drove to the dog kennel on the property and found his son and wife shot and non-responsive. Alec touched both victims in checking them for signs for life. He stated that he tried to roll Paul, but could not. He called 911 to report the deaths and then drove to his house to get protection and then drove back to the scene to wait for first responders. This is the first we've heard 
about not being able to roll him over. And we have heard that he was face down, that Paul was face down. Yes. So the question, because Alec is much bigger than Paul, how, why could he not roll him over? That seemed really, I mean, obviously if he was deceased, that's dead weight, but it still seemed that he would be able to roll him over. Mm -hmm. So that, had, that brings up a lot of questions for me why he wasn't. There was a, a report shortly after their deaths from Trey Gowdy saying that one of the victims was bound. No one else has reported this. Right. And it's not in any of the exhibits or anything like that. Yeah, we have seen yet. It is not in any of the exhibits, but we know that that would not likely have been Maggie because what has come out is that she was running. Mm -hmm. So if anyone was bound, it would be Paul. Not saying that's true, but that was reported by Trey Gowdy. And where Paul was found is a slight change. We had, I think it was, was a People magazine, did we decide? I reported that Paul was half in and half out of the dog kennel. Now we hear in this that he was shot where, Seton? He was shot in a small closet, which was a feed room. Or the dog kennels, right? Yes. And if, his, if that is true, that he was shot in the feed closet, and it's reported that his body was found outside near or around or whatever the dog kennel, but not in that closet, then the body was moved. That would bring that question up. I mean, I believe this was all in pretty close proximity. I have done some research today. The feed room was not in the building with a red roof. It was not in the building with a white roof. It was not in a little building at the end of the dog run. So I believe that the feed room was attached to the dog kennels. So if someone says the body was found near the kennels, it's also near the, the feed room. But if he was killed in this feed room... He would be in the feed room. And we also would have to talk about if he was killed in this feed room and Alec Murdoch was the one who shot him, you would think that there would be a tremendous amount of blood. The motion says there was a lot of blood on the walls and floors, and you would think he would have more blood on him. That's what the defense is saying in their uh, motion. But to play devil's advocate, he could have been wearing something to protect him from getting blood if on Alec. him. Right. If Alec did it, he could have been wearing something. It uh, says the blood was spattered. All over the closet door, walls, and ceiling, but there was no blood spatters on Murdoch's shirt. But again, like you said, he had some time is what we might hear from the state eventually. And we also have to say that this was the first time that we heard that Alec drove back to yes. the house to retrieve a gun for protection. We had not heard that before. Some of the other things that came out about this was the DNA swabs they took from the inside of a person's cheek. Uh, they Took it from Alec, Maggie, Paul, several Murdoch family members, some Colleton County police officers, some of the people that worked on the Murdoch Moselle property, survivors of the fatal 2019 boat crash involving Paul Murdoch, and family members of Mallory Beach who died in the crash. Obviously, they were looking for people who had motivation to possibly kill Maggie or Paul. It has come up a lot since then of why Eddie Smith was not tested. But I don't know at the time that these DNA samples were taken that Alec's financial picture was clear to everyone. Like Cousin Eddie really enters the scene of the, the Labor Day weekend suicide for hire murder plot. Now, if they haven't taken his DNA since that time, that's a question. That's true. They And we had known that they had tested people involved in the boat crash. Right. They actually, I believe the families issued statements shortly after the murders of Maggie and Paul saying that they voluntarily submitted their DNA. Mm -hmm. Now, there's all, what was the other DNA they found? They found DNA and items of evidence tested that came from three unidentified, unrelated individuals. Also, there was DNA swabs from fingernail clippings of both Paul and Maggie. Paul's only had Paul's under it. But it appears as if Maggie has some other DNA. From an unidentified person. And C.B. Rowe, who was an employee there or a former employee, they said he was not completely ruled out, but it said greater than 90% probability that it was not him. Not him. Not him. Okay. So they also took DNA swabs from a bunch of cell phones and a couple of vehicles. 
Right. And the Chevy Suburban steering wheel identified some blood. And in that, it said the DNA profile is approximately 35 times more likely if Margaret Murdoch and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. But there was none, none of the uh, DNA swabs on most of the other cars that showed nothing, right? It was just the steering wheel. Just the steering wheel. So I would definitely like to dive more into this in a future episode. They also took DNA swabs on a, a whole bunch of guns, a Palmetto State Armory PA-15 rifle with night vision scope, Mossberg Model 835 Ultimag shotgun, uh, and it goes on from there. They also took it on several shotgun shoe, uh, shells, Murdoch shirt, shoes, green shorts, and raincoat. Yes, it talks about a blue raincoat that was tested. We don't know for sure if this was the same raincoat that we talked about in a previous episode that was recovered from Almeida. But it says that due to limited information obtained and the inability to determine the number of contributors, no further interpretation will be offered. Which to me, that is kind of what we, if it is the same raincoat, what we Mm -hmm. said. There's uh, in the motion all kinds of photos of Murdoch's shirt, several sled DNA analysis reports. So we want to bring in a cool dude. He's uh, been on the Nancy Grace show with me, and he has a podcast called Body Bags. He is a professor at Jacksonville State University. He is associate professor of applied forensics, holds a master of forensic science degree from National University. And he worked for the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office in New Orleans as a senior investigator with the Fulton County Medical Examiner in Atlanta and many more. He's helped establish national training guidelines for death investigators. He is Joseph Scott Morgan. Hello, Joseph. Hey. Hey, how are you guys? Good to be with y'all. Thanks for having me. All right. So you've seen the motion that I sent you, one of the Big bones of contention with the defense is that they didn't have a chance to test the blood on Ellick's shirt, but yet the state did. Explain to us what's going on here. Just to kind of start off, we have in forensics what are called destructive and non-destructive testing that goes on. And just taking the in, into context, the idea of the shirt, this, this standalone white t-shirt, which when you see it, it's... You know, there's this image that they put up of this crew neck T-shirt that is striking. You know, it's very striking when you see it, bone white. But yet on one portion of it, you can see where they have essentially applied uh, an agent to the shirt in order to kind of get the blood uh, or the evidence of the blood to lumen else. And, you know, that that happens with great frequency uh, because you have to test it in this manner to prove that, in fact, blood is there. And the testing they did interacts with what's called the hemoglobin in the blood. It's not an identifier, per se, to say that this is the blood of so-and-so, okay? It's just merely to demonstrate that it is, in fact, blood. That's just one of the steps that we go through in forensics. That's all fine and good, but... <laughs> There's another image of the shirt that is the thing that, for me, is quite striking. They've taken the shirt, and it looks like what you would imagine a small child taking a pair of kitty scissors to a piece of paper and shredding it, cutting it up. There's big chunks that are gone out of the shirt. And that was done for the purposes of DNA testing. And, you know, they come from different quadrants of the shirt. And that's kind of how we do it. You know, when you you think about the the shirt itself, you have to break it down into various zones so that you can demonstrate that if you're doing DNA testing, that this was derived, this the sample was derived from, say, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And that not only gives you an indication of, accountability relative to where it's coming from, but it also gives you an idea of activity, like points of contact. Because, you know, one of the one of the big things with this case is that he essentially bent over the body to examine them and drew them in, perhaps, they think, or maybe checking them for signs of life. And this, what comes about as a result of this is what's referred to as transfer. 
And it looks completely different than some kind of high velocity event where you have blood that is blown onto a shirt uh, or onto any other surface from a high velocity gunshot wound. The problem arises in sense that once this is done, the defense doesn't get a bite at the apple. They don't. It's gone. It's essentially gone forever and ever. Amen. And and it's 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 fantastic grounds for the defense to you know to protest over or to file a motion to say, look, this is a problem. We want to have our own expert come in and take a look at this. Well, it's gone now. What are you going to do about that? You know, and that's a question that has to be asked of the state. And the state has to answer. Their examiner, who's based out of Oklahoma and is pretty well respected, uh, had a shot at examining for the dynamics of the blood staining, not necessarily relative to DNA. You've got two separate things going on here. And that kind of complicates this. They had an opportunity to examine for the dynamics of the blood staining. We want our people to have an opportunity to examine the blood stains. Well, how are you going to do that? Now that you've cut the shirt to pieces, you lose all context from just, you know, I mean, anybody, it's, this isn't rocket science. I mean, if you, if you want to examine something, do you, or do you not want it to be in the pristine state when you examine it? All right. Because your, your baseline data is blown at that point. And that's what the defense is, is arguing here. It's a sensible argument. You know, regardless of how you feel about the case, it's it's sensible. And so, to the best of my knowledge, the defense hasn't had their opportunity. There were three tests. The first test that they did was, I think I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but phenophthalene. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And that, I guess, turns it pink. Can you explain what this test is first? Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the verification that you have blood there. That That's simply all it is. That's... That's kind of the gateway, the gateway um, test. And do you know, do you know why they did that? And let me kind of break this down. This is kind of interesting. When you're talking about high velocity blood staining, okay, sometimes that blood is so fine you can't see those little droplets, okay. And so it's not like uh, if, if anyone in the audience could imagine taking your hand and putting it in a pool of blood and you take it and you smear it on a wall, that stands out pretty well, right? So this, this test, it will capture anything that is not seen with what we refer to in science as the unaided eye. You know, you have to be able to visualize it either through a chemical reaction or microscopically. Microscopically is sometimes difficult. So, if they throw this agent, you know, on the shirt itself, then it's going to react with the proteins in the blood. And that's demonstrative of the presence of blood. Now, does this actually mean that this is human blood? No, it just merely means that it's blood. This test is like the first, it's the gateway through the testing of the blood, you know, because, you know, traditionally the way the blood, blood testing has worked, you, you have to verify that something is blood. You know, we hear people say, well, look at the blood all at the scene. Um, you know, look at that blood stain that's there. Well, as forensic scientists, that's a big, you know, that's counterintuitive to us. We're not going to say, yeah, look at that blood simply based on a photograph that we're looking at. I can't say that that's blood. And I know people think that that's nonsensical, but you can't. You can't in court. You can't say that because the next question after that is, how do you know that's blood? Well, we've been down this road enough as forensic scientists to know that we have to verify that. So you look at the blood or what you think is blood and you test it. All right. And you say, OK, this is, in fact, blood. Well, the next question is, is it human or is it an animal? Well, you have to go for another test to verify that. And then after that, well, if it's human, whose blood is it? Then you get into blood typing. All right. And there are tests for that. And then, of course, beyond that. You're looking for, and, D, and, you know, the blood itself is is rich in DNA. It's not like touch DNA, which is just kind of a partial strand. I mean, blood is very rich in DNA and can get a great sample for it. So this color change that you're seeing is merely that chemical being applied to the shirt, and it reacts with that blood sample that is there that you might not otherwise be able to see. And it's fantastic in court because most people think that you see blood and it's any of its number of states, in any of its numbers of states, you know, it could be 
fresh. It's going to be brilliant red. And then it kind of dries. Uh, you get it, it'll become flaky. And sometimes, you know, I've been on scenes where blood looks like melted chocolate. I had a friend of mine, uh, actually a forensic scientist that was at a scene one time and mistaked, he, he actually mistakenly called uh, melted chocolate blood that was smeared on a pair of pants. And that's just, you know, one of those little stories along the way that you, you know, you, you speak to kids that you're instructing and say you never call anything blood until you can scientifically verify it. <laughs> When you get into this with the staining and this coloration, you're compromising the sample at that point in time. Well, one of the things that I found interesting was that it appears like there were these transfer stains at mm. the bottom of the shirt that showed blood, but the top mm. of the shirt did not actually show any blood. Right. The second test that they conducted in July of 2021 was this LCV test, um, which turned the shirt the blue and violet colors. Mm -hmm. So every time a test is done, the whole look of the shirt is changing, right? It's changing every time. Yeah. And it's, it's changing the dynamics of it change relative to what's being applied to it. And further down, you further down this road, you go with testing, the more your sample is being compromised. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the problem that the defense team is you know, is trying to make hay out of here. Explain to us about high velocity spatter, back spatter, and why there may or may not be blood in that. Well, there's a difference between back spatter and the high velocity spatter uh, that you're talking about. And, you know, blood stain experts, which I am not one of, I'm merely a forensic scientist, um, but they do have a delineation between these two. The The size of the droplet, for instance, as the blood droplet travels through the air, is going to be different, you know, with, with back spatter as opposed to what you would have if this is a directed blast. Like if, if a person is fired upon, let's say, for instance, and the projectile travels through the body and that directed high velocity spray comes out of that wound as the round exits, that the dynamics of that event from just a physics standpoint and the shape of the droplets as they strike the surface that blood is going to look different in that particular instance, as opposed to, say, for instance, if you're standing over someone and you're firing, say, in a if you're in a dominant or asymmetrical position where, and this has been kind of opined, I think, quite a bit in this particular case, uh, where you're standing over somebody where you're literally in a position where you're traditionally, people would say, in execution stance, you're dominant over them. Well, that blood as it it exits from the actual entrance wound as opposed to an exit wound. So that dynamic is completely different. So you've got the round going in there and impacting, impacting that tissue. And the blood is blowing back out the same wow. defect which the round actually entered. So that dynamic is completely different for blood spatter experts when they look at this. And if I'm getting it right, the back spatter is one if you're shooting the person and it's come blowing back at you. Yes, that's okay, accurate. Okay. Is it possible to have spatter without blood? Could it be bone? Disgusting as maybe brain. I, I, I like suppose that. so, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be identified as okay. such though. You wouldn't identify that in the same way you would identify a blood dynamic. Uh, blood is very distinct and that particular uh, practice within forensic science, you know, draws a line, you know, between that because you know, with for instance, when we have um, I don't want to get too overly graphic, but let's let's just say we have a gunshot wound in the head. Okay, in any case, not in this particular case, we have a gunshot wound in the head, and you have this high velocity event that's occurring. Well, you will have, uh, unfortunately, brain matter that extrudes from the wound, and it also travels through the air. There's a dynamic to that too, and but it's you know, brain though it's very soft is not liquid. And that dynamic is completely different. Bone, again, it does travel through the air, but it's not going to present the same way. Skin, same way. It will present in its own unique way. So to kind of marry those two things up is not entirely accurate, I don't think, in this case. Would it be unlikely to see some sort of impact spatter, whether it's bone or brain, and it not include some amount of blood? 
Yeah, you're right. I, I think that there would be adjacent blood to that. Now, how much? I, I can't say because these things are very hard to to quantify. Famously, within bloodstain, uh, the bloodstain discipline, you know, they they state that the volume of blood is very difficult to even have an estimate. These questions are asked all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, generally, all you can really say is that there's you know trace amounts of blood, or you'll hear, particularly in cases. Uh, where someone has been, there's like a tremendous amount of trauma. They'll say there's copious amounts of blood and there's really no middle ground there. And, you know, it's really hard to, to measure the volume of blood that is coming out of a body. You could blow back tissue onto an individual. It would be that, that would call for what's uh, referred to. If you're looking specifically for tissue, I'm not talking about blood now. Okay. If you're looking for tissue, like, Elements of bone, skin, brain, or any other organ or muscle, that's, that would require what's referred to as a, uh, a gross examination using a microscope. And there's a, there are several types of microscopes that you can use for that purpose where you'll have the microscopist that will take the questioned area, okay, of, of the material. And they'll look over it very, very carefully and they can photograph all, all this and you can look at it and say, you know, this is a deposition of brain matter or this is a deposition of bone. And they would and actually you can you can sample that. You can take it, put it under a slide, for instance, and, you know, brain matter, uh, brain tissue has very distinctive cellular structure to it. And it's easily identified by, by a physician by a forensic pathologist or an anatomist, bone the same way, very distinctive. It's completely different, though, than blood. Let me ask you about this third test that was conducted actually just a few months ago in August of 2022. It's called a hematrace test, and I guess this is the test that turned the shirt black. Reading this pleading, it seems that it was to test for DNA. Can you kind of go over the specifics of what this test was? Well, I, I can't go over the specifics of that test because, I'm honestly, I am not very familiar with it. But if it's – I can tell you this. If, if the color change is so very distinctive in this case, because you're searching for DNA, you know, you, you've got two – Two competing interests here. You're you're looking to identify specific DNA sample, and you're also trying to identify uh, the dynamics of a, a blood stain event. Those two things scientifically are kind of counterintuitive, aren't they? You know, they're because it's going to the bread and butter of anybody that works in in trace analysis and specifically in blood stain pattern analysis is being able to eyeball this and being able to appreciate appreciate it visually. And so it's going to make it very difficult to understand the dynamic of the event when everything is blacked out, all right? And that's, that's that in and of itself is problematic. What do you think about Bevel changing his opinion? First opinion was that it wasn't consistent with any sort of spatter. And then second opinion came back after, I guess, reviewing more photographs that it was spatter. Is it unusual to change your opinion? Yes. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Let me kind of frame this. Um, and that's by no fault of his. Okay. What that means is, is that if he changed it based upon new incoming data, that means that he wasn't sufficiently supplied with the data that he needed to make the assessment in the first place. Now, some people will go in and they'll they'll make an assessment and they'll say, yeah, I need more data. And you furnish them with more data. And then it's at that point in time that, that they'll make a ruling and they'll print out a report. But it seems as though that <laughs> for whatever reason, some type of communication was derived, you know, where he, he rendered in a, some type of opinion and and then... And then more data was provided and he changed it. And that's that's kind of odd from my way of thinking. You want to make sure that your expert is supplied with every bit of data. The problem that arises is the one that they're kind of staring, staring down right now, isn't it? Because yeah. you know, this is this is fair play for the for the defense. 
sorry, prosecution, but you know, if you're, you have to make sure that your ducks are in a row for you to release any information because now, again, regardless of what anybody thinks of the case, when this thing goes to court, that, that is a question that has to be asked and answered. And they have to be able to explain it because it, it's, it gives the appearance, it gives the appearance that for some reason he was compelled to change his, 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 his opinion. That doesn't mean that it's nefarious. It just means that he was provided with more data that, you know, maybe cleared the clouds away a little bit more. They've been working on this thing long enough that they should have given that data to him to begin with. Mm. Well, speaking of data that he may or may not have received, the defense is claiming that Bevel was never provided the test that's saying that blood was not in this area where spatter was supposed to be, that there was no blood there. Mm. So I guess if he wasn't given that full picture, do you think that would be a problem? Yeah, it would be a problem. Again, it's, he needs to have everything that's at their disposal. This guy's in Oklahoma. You know, it's not like he's at SLED, you know, looking over their shoulder, you know, as they're doing this, they're having to, and you know, that was another issue I think that came up and forgive me if I can't recall, I think that, you know, the whole hand delivery of yes. the saying, you know, for accountability and the maintaining of the integrity of the chain of custody and all that sort of yep. thing. I understand that, you know, that we, we teach that <laughs> in, at university, you know, in forensics, in our forensic studies. And that's, you know, that's kind of baseline, you know, understanding chain of custody. It is certainly problematic, I think, for him, again, if he doesn't have everything. You have to provide these experts with every bit of data that you have, everything from Jump Street, because you get you get one you get one swing at it. You know, he's only going to get to issue one report. You have to make sure that he has if you're investing the time, the money and they are. <laughs> You want to make sure that you get it right and provide your expert with everything. Joe yeah. Scott Morgan, the podcast is Body Bags. You'll dig it. It's cool. Beers on Nancy Grace a lot. Good guy. And he knows his stuff. And we'll have you back on. Uh, Joe, thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And of course, we want to mention that this is just the defense motion. The state, the prosecution has not had a response yet. So we're just covering what was in this defense motion. And we haven't mentioned yet in this episode that there was a leak that said Alec Murdoch, was it right before Thanksgiving? Yes. Was offered a plea deal. An informal plea deal is what Fitz News reported. Fitz News reported it. 30 years is what the report said he was offered. And now there's been a response. Yes. The Attorney General's office has responded, and they say... Any claim that the state extended a plea offer to the defense, much less in response to or because of any defense motion, is false. Shot that down pretty quickly. All right, so that puts a wrap on it. And you can reach us, Murdoch Podcast, Facebook, MurdochPodcast.com, or Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. And we'll talk soon, friend.